Fire and Ice myth originally comes from Norse creation myth. And the past Sunday, the major fire and ice ritual basically was telling the audience about how the earth and the beings formed in the very beginning according to Norse creation myth. That's why it's, uh, it's kind of confusing because the red is representing fire, the blue is representing the ice. But the whole imagery um, over the whole halftime show looked like um, the representation of the events in hell, in the abyss. So now let me tell you the nose creation myth. Fire and ice from the abyss. So that's why the whole imagery throughout the show looked like in the abyss. Okay. The nose people were the ancient tribal communities and of Scandinavia who in the modern day are often referred to or thought of as the Vikings who were actually a subset of them. Like many other ancient communities, they had their own ideas about how the earth and the universe were created. Our understanding of the Norse creation myth comes from a small number of sources. The most useful of these were created in the medieval period and therefore do not come from the time when Scandinavian people were telling these myths. World well, building according to the Norse creation myth. According to the Norse creation myth, in the beginning there was nothing. This void of darkness was given the name Jinan Eventually, two other realms came into existence and were given the names Nifelheim and Muspelheim. Nifelheim was located in the north and was characterized by extremely cold weather and eternal darkness. It was thought to have been the realm of ice with nothing there but frost and fog. So that's why the blue imagery with the major center of the stage, there was a sea, looks like crystal. And that crystal technically is the ice because the liquid form of water is Liquid and then the so, sorry, the solid form of the liquid is crystallized and it's called ice, right? So that's why uh, when um, that performer he was sitting on technically is the ice throne, okay? Uh, Muspelheim, on the other hand, was known for its fire and extreme heat. There was nothing there but lava and smoke. It eventually became the home of the fire giant Surtur, who was eventually accompanied by fire demons and other fire giants. So that's why the other performer, the female, quote unquote, you know, the so-called female, she was wearing red and the piano was red. So basically it's representing Muspelheim, the lava and smoke, so the whole stage had a name called Jinan Gage. It was also said that there was a spring which was given the name Verjame. From this spring, freezing cold rivers were formed. These rivers were collectively named Elevaga, which meant ice waves. It was the water from this source that also fed Egdrasil, the world tree. 
According to some records of the creation myth, the water from these rivers flowed across Junagagab and through its desolate mountain ranges. There, they solidified into ice and formed layers upon layers of frozen wasteland. The first beings in Norse creation myth, according to Norse method mythology, the first beings to occupy this desolate, dark wasteland were giants. The first giant was given life when sparks from the extremely hot Muspelheim flew into Jinan Gagat. The lava and the spark from Muspelheim uh, began to melt the ice that had come from Nifelheim. Eventually, one block of ice began to melt away, revealing the form of a man. This would be the first Yodin. And he was given the name Ymir. Ymir then gave life to other beings. For when he fell asleep, two more giants grew from his wet. One of these new giants was a female and the other a male. Um, from the rest of Ymir's wet came their child, Thargomir. The three formed the first family of giants. These early giants were sustained by breastfeeding from a cow named Autumn Blair, who had also been formed from the melting ice in Jinnagaga alongside Ymir. These giants and the cloud Autumn Blair were the creators of all other beings. Autumn Blair sustained herself by licking a salty rock or block of ice until one day a man a human man emerged from the rock. The man would be the first god and was given the name Buri. Buri was said to be big and handsome and would eventually take a wife by the name of Bethsla and produce a son named Bo. Today is February 14, Wednesday. How much time for major events? And if not today, then will be this coming Friday and Saturday, the 16th and 17th. How much time for major FFs? Next week, of course, um, the whole week is pretty much how much time for rapture, roughly speaking. But high watch time for major events, major FFs. Is from the 22nd to the 25th, then um, the rest of the February, and then um, so particularly 26, 28, 29, and then this is the fifth woe. Let's see. Woe to you, self righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you give a tenth of your mint and dew and cumin. Focusing on uh, minor matters and have neglected the waiter, weightier, more important moral and spiritual provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the primary things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You spiritually blind guys who string out a net consuming yourselves with minuscule, minuscule matters and swallow a camel, ignoring and violating God's precepts. This is the sixth woe. Woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of extortion, and robbery and self-indulgence and restrained greed. Your, you spiritually blind Pharisee first clean the inside of the cup and of the plate, examine and change your inner self to conform to God's precepts so that the outside, your public life and deeds may be clean also. This is the seventh woe. Let's see. 
Um, okay. Woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside and inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. So you. Also, outwardly seem to be just and upright to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy, hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you! This is the eighth. Woe, woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you bind a build tombs for the prophets. And decorate and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and you say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have joined them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the allotted measures. Measure of the guilt of your father's sins, you serpents, you spawn of vipers. How can you escape the penalty of hell? Therefore, take notice. I am sending you prophets and wise men, interpreters, teachers, and scribes, men educated in the Mosaic law. And the writings of the prophets, some of them you will kill and even crucify, and some of you, some you will flog in your synagogues, and pursue and persecute from city to city, so that on you will come the guilt of all the blood of the righteous shed on earth, from the blood of righteous. Able to the blood of Zechariah the priest, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, the judgment for all these things, these vile and murderous deeds, will come on this generation. So the second section of chapter twenty-three is pretty straightforward. The eight bowls. And then the third section in chapter twenty-three is the lament over Jerusalem, and it's pretty straightforward. And、um, it's like God wanted Jerusalem to repent and be righteous again, 